Hello, and thank you for watching this video. We're going to talk about the geography of the United States today. Not everybody loves geography. Some people think it's boring. Reality, geography is life or death. Throughout history, people have had to adapt to their geography or literally die. Geography makes a country what it is. The United States of America has great ge geography and it has made us a wealthy, great country. So as most people know, the United States is made up of 50 states. Two of them, however, are not contiguous with the other 48, Alaska, up north and Hawaii out in the Pacific. So we're going to be talking about the geography of the lower 48 of the contiguous states that sit below Canada and north of Mexico. The United States is on the continent of North America and it's the third largest country in the whole world behind Russia and Canada. United States has two oceans, one on the East Coast, the Atlantic Ocean, and one on the West Coast. So what did it mean historically to have an ocean on both sides? So oceans isolate people. And traditionally, before planes, trains, and automobiles, having an ocean on the East and West Coast meant we were cut off from most of the world. This had a positive effect because it protected Americans from attack. You had to cross an ocean. Until the 15th century, ships were not big enough, strong enough, fast enough to cross the oceans. So it protected us from invasion. It also protected us from getting involved in other conflicts. If there was a war happening in Europe, which there often was, the United States would not get drawn into that war because we were across the Atlantic. On the other hand, being isolated meant that we were not privy to new technology, new ideas that were happening and were being invented in different parts of the world. The Americans would not hear about that. So isolation has positive and negative effects. So that's your first question to answer today. What is a positive and a negative effect of America being separated by the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean? Okay, if you forgot already, just go back and rewatch that part of the video. The United States is so large. I already said it was the third largest in the world. We have different topographical regions. Depending on where you go in the United States, it's a whole different world. So the United States is broken up into five topographical regions. The first, starting from the East Coast, is the Atlantic Coastal Plain. Then we have the Appalachian Mountains, also on the East Coast, on the East. Next are the Central Lowlands, and the Great Plains. So that's in the middle of the country. Then as we go out west, you have your western mountain ranges and basins. So we'll briefly look at each of these five regions. The Atlantic Coastal Plain. So this starts up in New England, goes all the way down to Georgia, and actually even extends over to Texas. This is where the colonists came originally. This is where your 13 colonies are. And when they first came here, the area was mostly forest and the forest had to be cut down to make farmland. It is fertile land for the most part in this area. The farther south you go, the more fertile the land, the better the climate for farming. So that's your Atlantic coastal plain. 
Next, you have the Appalachian Mountains. If you look at the map in the upper right, you see the red line there? That's where the Appalachian Mountain regions run. And there are several mountain ranges that are part of the Appalachians, the Adirondacks, the Allegheny, the Blue Ridge, and the Great Smokies. Now moving over west toward the middle of the country, you have your central lowlands. These start up in the northern part of the country in Minnesota. They go down through New York and as far south as Tennessee. This area was created by glaciers during the Ice Age. As the glaciers slowly moved, they left behind a type of soil called loess. And this was great soil for farming. This is the most fertile area in the country. So the far down south, there was more of this rich soil. Up north, a lot of it got blown. It was, it's not as thick, but this is where the best farmland is. As you move farther west to the center of the country, you have the Great Plains. These are vast regions of grasslands. There are many farms in this area, but the land is drier and hillier than in the lowlands. So though there are farms today and have been traditionally, it is more challenging to farm here. And in fact, you'll You'll learn about something called the Dust Bowl in the 1930s, where the, the farmland is overused, the land and the soil is so dry that it is literally going to blow away. Many people will lose their farms and have to move out west. Now we're out west, and there are huge, beautiful mountain ranges uh, called the, Mounty, the Rocky Mountains. And they go from California down to New Mexico. And in between the mountains are something called a basin, which is a depression in the earth. And that separates the Rocky Mountains from the Sierra Nevada range. This area is very desert-like, very different than other parts of the country. You will see cactus here and um, dry, arid, hot, land and areas. So that's a little bit about each of the topographical regions in the United States. So to test your memory a little, here is a question. Where is the best farmland located in the country and why? All right, the climate in the United States, whatever you like, we got it. If you like it cold, you love your winters, you want to ski, you can move up north. Minnesota gets snow in October. You like it warm? We've got tropical weather in southern Florida. If you like it more temperate, where it's pretty much the same all year round, then head out to San Diego. Their average temperature is around 70 degrees all year long. And if you like the four seasons, lots of the country has that. Most of the country is what's called continental climate, which means you have four seasons, depending where you are. Winter may be a little longer, or summer may be a little longer if you go down south. But most of the country has this temperate four season climate. Natural resources, another thing that the United States is rich in. We have natural resources of all kinds. I've noted a few of them here, natural gas, coal, oil, gold, iron, silver. So in the mid 1800s, silver and gold were found out west and tens of thousands of people moved out west. What happens to an area when they find coal or gold or oil in an area? How does it affect that area? Well, people go where the money is. People go where the jobs are and the opportunity. So when a natural resource is discovered, that area will grow very quickly. 
the population will increase. You will have towns that just grow up overnight. And uh, this could be a positive thing for the area. It adds lots of opportunities, not just for that natural resource, but now you need stores and you have trade. It also can be negative because to access some of these natural resources, you have to deface the earth. You can, when you dig for coal, oil, you can do harm to the Earth's surface, so there is also a negative impact. All right, are you paying attention? Do you know how natural resources affect an area? That's your next question to answer. If you weren't listening or if you forgot already, just go back a little bit. Next, we got the Great Lakes. All right, these are all the way up north, partially in Canada, partially in the United States. There are five Great Lakes, and it's easy to remember them because they spell out the name home, well, the word homes. You've got Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, and Lake Superior. Those are the Great Lakes. We got rivers too. The United States pretty much has it all. The largest river is the Mississippi River. That runs north to south and was the lifeblood for farmers for many, many years. They could put their produce on boats and barges, send it down the Mississippi and trade. But it could also go all the way down south to New Orleans where they could ship their goods out to other parts of the world. So the Mississippi is our biggest and probably most important river, but we have others as well. The Hudson River is in New York, and the Hudson River helped to connect farmers up north and west once late, uh, the Erie Canal was built. It connected people in the whole region to be able to trade. New York City is a major harbor where trade comes from all over the world and the Hudson River helped bring the goods to other parts of the country. The Rio Grande is the at the border of Texas and Mexico, a major river that there was some conflict over, which we'll learn another time. And finally, we have the Colorado River, which is out west. This supplies water to California, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada. It's a very important river out west. Next, we have harbors. What is a harbor? So a harbor is a place that ships can safely dock. The ships come across the Atlantic or from the Pacific you can't park a ship in the ocean. If the water is too rough, you need calm water. And a harbor is an area where the water is calm. If you look at the picture on the right, that is a harbor. See, there's an inlet that makes the water not as volatile and the ships it can dock. Most of the harbors in the country are on the East Coast and as well as New Orleans, which I mentioned before, which is in the uh, South. There are a few harbors on the west coast, but for the most part, the coastline on the west is much rockier. If you look at the picture up on the upper left, the coastlines doesn't really have harbors for ships to dock and for trade to happen. All right, so how will these waterways help the United States? especially before the advent of mass transportation, trains and planes and automobiles. Why was it so important to have harbors and rivers and lakes? That's your next question. Stop for a minute, see if you can answer that. If not, go back and listen again. All right, so that's an overview of the geography of the United States. 
based on the geographic factors that we talked about and the climate, uh, where in the United States would you most like to live and why? And refer to geographic features in your answer. Okay, let's see if you can stop and do that. Finally, because you paid attention and you were so good, it's time for a corny riddle. I personally love corny riddles, so I like to end my uh, videos with them. You ready? Why did the snail cross the road? Hmm. Why did the snail cross the road? We don't know. He didn't get there yet. Get it? Snail's really, really slow. Are you laughing? Are you groaning? Uh, I tried. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you learned something.